This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Solvagi. Welcome to Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute, a think tank in Boston. Derek Chauvin, the police officer convicted for killing George Floyd, was a member of a police department that had received 2,600 complaints in the prior decade, for which only 12 led to discipline and no terminations. This lack of accountability for poor performance in police forces as well as public schools, mass transit, and other public services is owed in no small part to the power of public employee unions. Those who fight for reform understand that it is union leadership rather than elected officials who must be bargained with before government can serve the larger public. This power of public unions to superintend the process of government, indeed to use collective bargaining to become de facto legislators, grants governing power to groups that answer to their membership but are not accountable to the public at large. Indeed, owing to the power of public unions to influence elections and effectively choose their own candidates, neither voters nor well-intentioned reformers have the ability to wrest authority back to the people. But does this distortion of the process of governing run afoul of our constitution's imperative that all power lies with the people? Does collective bargaining with public unions violate our Constitution's prohibition of ceding government power to protected classes? And is there a legal cure for dysfunction that is beyond the reach of reform and for government institutions that are at present intractably ungovernable? My guest today is Philip K. Howard, attorney, policy reform advocate, chair of Common Good, and author of six best-selling books, including the recently released Not Accountable, Rethinking the Constitutionality of Public Employee Unions. As a longtime advocate for better governance, Mr. Howard contrasts his support for the fiduciary mission of public servants with the many ways in which public unions act against the public interest. His book examines the ways in which the structure of public unions cede governing power to unelected officials, leaving government ineffective and unaccountable. Mr. Howard forwards several legal theories that challenge the constitutionality of public employee unions and asks readers to consider if the courts may be able to reform what voters and well-intentioned elected officials cannot. When I return, I'll be joined by attorney and author Philip K. Howard. Yep. Okay, we're back. This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Silvaggi, and I'm now pleased to be joined by attorney, reform advocate, and author of the newly released book, Not Accountable, Rethinking the Constitutionality of Public Employee Unions, Philip Howard. Welcome to Hubwonk, Philip. Nice to be with you, Joe. Well, it's, it's, it's a real honor. I enjoyed, I was captivated by your book, Not Accountable. Um, and you're a distinguished author with five other books. I haven't had the pleasure of reading all of them, but I'm, I'm, I promise to dive into them more thoroughly. <laughs> Um, but in this book, uh, it seemed to me from writing it, from reading it, it, it seemed to me to be something of a creed de coeur, someone who is passionate about uh, uh, the good workings of government, wants it to do a better job. And, and for some reason or other, uh, the government can't govern. So uh, you make a clear argument that one of the reasons uh, we have such a hard time governing ourselves is public employee unions. I want our listeners not to take away that we are uh, opposed to unions or organized labor in general, but we're singling out public employee unions. Share with our listeners, what is the fundamental difference between uh, private trade unions and what we're talking about public employee unions? Uh, they're, they're completely different. The origin story is different. Um, but it fundamentally, uh, trade unions uh, basically involve a negotiation between capital and labor about how to split the pie of profit. That's generally what, what happened down. And I think trade unions can play an important role in keeping all employers honest. So many big employers don't want to unionize because they don't want to have that interference with management. But, but the fear of being unionized makes them have fairer practices for their workers. So I think, you know, it's a useful thing. Public unions never had the problems um, that they gave rise to the private unions. The gov working for government was sort of sleepy. There were civil service protections already, you know, so they were protected. There were no scandals or abuses or the like that gave rise to this. And the difference, and FDR was very clear that 
that trade union negotiations could not be transplanted, as he put it, into the public service because of a couple of things. First of all, there are no market forces in public negotiation that limit how much people can go for. If you go for too much in the private sector, the employer will go out of business and everybody will lose their job or the employer will move out of town. Government can't move out of town. So if so, the unions can get whatever they can get away with, with, with the politician and the taxpayers have to pay. So there's really no limit except public outrage to, to what they can bargain for. But the more important difference is the nature of the negotiations. It would be unlawful for management and complicit labor in a, in a business context to, to collude, to somehow uh, do something that hurt the shareholders. That's actually unlawful under the National Labor Relations Act. Public bargaining is really nothing but collusion. The public unions devote huge resources to getting favorable candidates elected. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars sometimes with governors when busloads of union workers and such manning their campaigns. And then when they get elected, they don't sit on the opposite side of the bargaining table. They go to the same side of the bargaining table and say, now, what are you going to give me? And so it's not really a negotiation. It's a payoff. And, and this, yeah, and this is something that only happened in the last 50 years. So people, the public really never was aware of how different the negotiations and the stakes were in the public sector versus the private sector. You laid that out very well. I want to go to something even more fundamental that when one is a uh, public uh, servant, one has uh, arguably a fiduciary responsibility to the public. In other words, one has, of course, private interests. You want a, a comfortable working space. You want fair wages. But you ultimately are working for someone else, and not, not for yourself. Explain to our listeners, what does that mean to be a fiduciary versus being a, a private, private employee? Yeah, so the concepts of fiduciary duty in law comes up when, uh, w when someone occupies a position that gives them un potentially undue power over another. So for example, a lawyer owes fiduciary duty to a client because the lawyer could, has all the client's confidences, right? And it can't, um, and so it has a duty not to somehow use those for ill purposes. Um, Someone who's a custodial of money or a trustee of a family trust has a fiduciary duty because they have in their control all these resources that are designed to be used to benefit another person. And so they have to have a, a higher duty than simply the duty that workers have for their employers, which is basically a duty of contract. What's similar with public employees, public employees have enormous um, power over the public. They, 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 they're the ones who give permits or not. They're the ones who arrest you on the street or search you or not for the cops. They're the ones who, who, who are uh, trying to run the best possible schools. And, and they, the law is that they owe a fiduciary duty to the public. They have to be looking out for the public interest. FDR, again, was very big on this. He said, you know, the problem with bo public bargaining by, by unions is that it puts the unions first in line over all other public interest, whereas a, a political leader owes his complex responsibilities, his fiduciary duty, to the, as FDR put it, to the whole people. Indeed. You have to, to the whole people. So, so this is, this, you know, uh, another way of saying this is, if we're public school teachers, our, our obligation is to good, good education, not the welfare of teachers necessarily. We want to make sure our kids get educated. Or yeah. for police, we want to make sure yeah. they're putting their lives in danger, but for public safety. In other words, they're going out and chasing the so bad guy for my safety, not, not for their own. They, they have a, an extraordinary responsibility to the public, to the whole public not to themselves. And if, if they ultimately organize and negotiate for their particular cause, they're essentially on both sides of the table. With, so, so, you know, teachers have a right to a fair salary and decent work conditions and such. And there was actually an interesting 
ethical ruling in Massachusetts a few years ago that basically said it's fine for for public employees to negotiate for the kinds of things that a typical private employer would negotiate for, you know, make sure they have a fair salary. But that doesn't include putting in controls over the management of the public sector, nor does it include controls that make it virtually impossible ever to hold anyone accountable in the, in the public sector. So, so what the unions have done with this power is really become a kind of co-government. You know, it's, it's the, the multi-hundred page collective bargaining agreements that make it hard for any federal supervisor, anybody, not federal, any, any government supervisor, any you know, person running a police station or a school to make the kind of management choices uh, needed to make it be an effective, to provide an effective public service. So I want to develop the this uh, concept of why uh, uh, public unions can create a situation whereby, as you mentioned, they, it becomes impossible to manage government affairs. You start your book off with um, a particularly poignant example, uh, the case of Derek Chauvin, uh, the policeman who was responsible for George Floyd's death, uh, and uh, the fact that he had a pretty checkered past uh, one that everybody knew about, and uh, in a sense, the police themselves, the good police and the good police management, really weren't able to uh, uh, right. move away from the force. You cite in your book uh, many examples of the low rate at which uh, bad public employees are fired. So share with us why that story is so important to your thesis. Well, um, uh, de democracy is a process of accountability. You know, voters elect someone to run government, and if they do a lousy job, they elect someone else or elect a different party. And for accountability to be meaningful, it has to extend from the elected executive, the mayor or the governor, down through the ranks. So as Madison put it, the lowest level, the middle level, and the highest grade must be in a chain of dependence with the president in order for democracy to work. What's happened with public unions is that they've made it so that um, it's basically impossible to get rid of a public employee unless they, you know, commit a heinous crime or say something politically incorrect. So there was one study in Illinois, two out of 95,000 teachers a year over an 18 year study period were dismissed for poor performance. In California, it's even lower. Uh, the Massachusetts numbers, are, I think, are something like 0.01 to 0.02%. So you have a situation where everyone knows that performance doesn't matter. And the problem with that in government is not that there are lots of bad people in government. I assume most people want to do a good job. They go into government for the right reason, I assume. The problem is it's very hard to maintain a culture of service and excellence and pride when you know performance doesn't matter because you don't have the mutual trust that everybody else is working hard to make sure it works well. You know it doesn't matter. So it's like letting the air out of the balloon. So you have this gray, dreary public service that repels good candidates for public service because the, the bedrock condition of any good organizational structure, accountability, is non-existent. Indeed, your book talks about the fact uh, uh, that uh, both in the police force and in teachers, more people die while uh, in uh, in service than are uh, fired for performance. So right, I, I mean, in, in the Minneapolis the police department, which is where Derek Chauvin worked, in the prior decade to that killing, there had been something like twelve thousand complaints, or more than that of which only a handful resulted in any discipline. And the most severe discipline was a 40 hour suspension. Indeed. And, and of course, the, the victims of that, uh, we, we can name a lot of them. Of course, uh, George Floyd being one of them, it's terrible uh, what has happened. But of course now uh, the public paints policemen with such a broad brush when it's a very small minority of, of policemen who, are, who, who do these heinous acts. But of course, because they can't be fired, uh, now all the good policemen 
are painted with this awful brush. It must must be terrible for morale and performance. Right, that's correct. So, so there are lots of studies of 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 what it takes to, for for example, over overhaul the culture of police. Well, you've got to instill new values so that police don't tolerate misconduct when they see it. They don't have the blue wall of silence or whatever it's called, you know. And but that requires you to hold people accountable. And without accountability, it's basically impossible to fix a public any culture. Indeed, and again, your your book also talks about uh, current events. Uh, this past terrible pandemic, we we have public teachers unions. Um, you know, they were in a difficult situation. Uh, but when uh, the smoke started to clear and uh, uh, teachers were asked to go back to work or teach remotely, uh, they really relied on a, a union contracts as as excuses for not moving forward and 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 getting uh, the education to the kids. Right. It's truly a tragedy. I mean, the, the effect, particularly on inner city kids, of not going to school for two years was apparently almost irreparable, that they were set, testing at 17 percentile points lower than they were two years before at the end of the pandemic. But the teachers union said, well, the contract said nothing about teaching in a pandemic, so they refused to come back. And then they're asked to do, um, do remote teaching. They said, well, the contract said nothing about that. So that had to be negotiated. And in most places it was negotiated so that it was less than half of a typical teacher's work day. You know, like in one county I looked at, it was three hours of distance teaching. But, but it's not just big events like the pandemic, the smallest things, asking someone to help out, you can't do in, in most public agencies because that has to be negotiated. Uh, a, a government agency moves in office. Uh, you have to negotiate who sits at what desk. Literally, you get a new software program in the federal government. You have to negotiate how to use the new version of Word you know, or whatever, you know, on your on your computer. Um, uh, a work crew on the transit is out fixing things. They see an overhanging branch. The contract doesn't allow them simply to saw off or rip off the branch. They have to call in a new work crew so that there are studies that show that, for example, basic municipal services cost two to three times what they would cost in the private sector because of all these work rules. So what conceivable is what conceivable public justification is there for taxpayers paying twice as much when those resources could be used for dealing with homelessness or providing a, a, a music program at the school or any one of you know any one of a number of public goods and in, in, in these these collective bargaining agreements of multi hundreds of pages are not there to guarantee a fair salary you could do that in two pages <laughs> they're there to micromanage government in a way that basically makes it fail Indeed, I, you know, the, the teachers and uh, policemen I know um, have all kinds of ideas of how they could perform better uh, and deliver better services. Uh, but largely, the, the 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 barriers, obstacles to reform, really are their own um, union representatives. They're not allowed to uh, uh, improve uh, because it would undermine the power of the union. I mean, just to, in New York, it's on. It's against the country. It's against the collective bargaining agreement for a supervisor to ask employees how they would do things better. That violates the direct dealing requirement. You can only negotiate with the union rep. You can't ask other employees about better ways of serving the public. I mean, truly it's, it's, a, it's a system, it's almost like some kind of um, pathological personal relationship where the unions, want to show who's in control. Indeed. And so they negotiate all these requirements that really don't help anyone except maybe feather betting, you know, which hurts the taxpayers. 
Indeed. Well, I um, I don't think uh, banging on about pub the problems of public unions make us either of us particularly original thinkers. What I think is a fantastic element of your book is you do make a very strong case that the the, the process, the system itself is unconstitutional. You're an attorney, you study this deeply. So I want for our listeners who are not constitutional scholars to understand your argument and take them apart uh, piece by piece. Um, uh, you know, if I'm going to generalize, I think, you know, if we summarize what we've said already, um, there ought to be, by uh, the founder's design, a direct accountability from the voter to the people we put in charge to their ability to do their job. We hire somebody as our representative, uh, they uh, implement policies, the policies get implemented, and we decide whether they've done a good job or not. And if they don't, we throw the bums out. Uh, if they do a great job, they, they stay in office. At this point, we say, let's say at a high level, those politicians that we elect really have their hands tied by uh, if they want better uh, teachers uh, in teaching, they have to deal with teacher unions. They want better public safety, they have to deal with public safety people. But let, let's get to the, the constitutional argument, and you alluded to it in your first answer. Uh, it's an Article 2 issue, which is uh, we need our, um, our uh, elected representatives, specifically the president or the executive branch, to be able to do his job or her job. Um, explain for our listeners why uh, this is an a constitutional Article Two issue uh, uh, regarding employee uh, public employee unions. Well, in Article Two applies to the president and the executive branch, so it's only the federal government. But uh, there's an enormous amount of law under Article Two th that Congress cannot, by law, I mean Supreme Court precedent, Congress cannot take away the president's quote exclusive and illimitable power of removal of public employees. So for the president to run the executive branch, he has to be able, among other things, to choose who's doing a good job and who's not. Without any room for reasonable disagreement, uh, the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978, which mandates collective bargaining and mandates these very detailed procedures that effectively insulate federal employees from accountability, prevents that. And so in my judgment is clearly clearly unconstitutional. Um, the idea of executive power, though, as you alluded to, it comes from a broader um, constitutional doctrine that comes out of John Locke's second treatise, which is that when voters elect somebody to govern, they can't delegate that governing power to any private group. That they have to, it's a, it's a trust given to them by the voters and they have to keep that responsibility. And everyone learned in civics class that, that the constitution creates a republic. And what that means is that, that we elect people not to do what we say, but to act on their best judgment for a period of years to run the government. So they have to be accountable to the voters, but they have a period of time during their term in office in which they have to take the responsibility to make decisions. And, and what the unions have done is um, with legislative help from state legislatures and others uh, have taken away the authority to manage government so that when we elect a mayor, he actually has no authority to fire a rogue cock. We elect a mayor who appoints a school, head of the schools, they don't have authority to actually go and transform a lousy school because there's no accountability and there are all these work rules. So any of the tools needed for management are not available. So we've effectively delegated governing authority to a private group, these public employee unions, and I argue that that's clearly unconstitutional. Yeah, uh, you're, again, we could go on about all the instances of, of bad, you know, sort of bad governing that uh, good um, elected officials have their hands tied. They are literally unable to reform um, dysfunctional organizations because of these rules. Um, but rather than feel despair, and I, I think despair is a disease, your book does have some a few stories of success that actually, you know, for all the problems we talk about, some some elected officials have uh, had the courage to um, to reform these uh, public employee unions. Your uh, your 
opening uh, it was Mitch, Mitch Daniels did you, the forward of your book. Uh, he's a hero of mine. He's from Indiana. Uh, he did his work in Indiana. You also talk about Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Share with our listeners, uh, let's say someone who was brave enough and how, the, the the fire they had to walk through to make some. Right. Well, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So the opportunities here really are huge. And, you know, I mean, for decades now, people have just treated public unions as a state of nature, like it's a mountain range we can't do anything about. But in fact, if they are unconstitutional because of what they've done to governance, then the, the, the message is actually incredibly optimistic. So Mitch Daniels was able to uh, get rid of all union bargaining except over salaries. He kept that and it doesn't because he wanted to be able to manage government and the result, he was able to do that because bargaining had been permitted in Indiana only as a matter of executive order. So he could change that executive order as governor. And he did it. And really within a year, agencies started working much better. There were, you know, you could you know, renew your license, you know, and in a matter of minutes rather than take half a day out to do it and such. You know, it's just, you know, basic services work better. Scott Walker had to change the law in Wisconsin when he was governor. And the unions, to say that they opposed him would be an understatement. Um, they, uh, 100,000 people invaded the Capitol protesting his law. All the Democratic legislators left the state so there wouldn't be a quorum to vote on his law. He eventually got the rules changed so that he could exercise management powers again over the state. Uh, and then the unions brought in, national unions brought in tens of millions of dollars and initiated a recall um, of Walker to try to get him out of office. And so there was another election, another year and a half goes by with tens of millions of dollars spent. He won that. Then uh, the unions got a Democratic district attorney to indict Walker for alleged uh, campaign finance abuses during the recall election. And, uh, and that ultimately was thrown out by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. But the whole battle took four years. But at the end of that, Wisconsin was governable again, and they were saving literally five or more billion dollars a year. The, the school test scores have gone up. And, and the Republicans have come to office since Walker, I mean, the Democrats that have come to office since Walker left, they haven't wanted to put the controls back. Because if you gave truth serum to any Democratic governor or mayor, they would like nothing better than to get rid of the union controls because they can't manage their own government because of it. So it's a success story, but it's also a story that shows why few people do it. I mean, John Kasich, when he was governor of Ohio, uh, succeeded in getting a similar reform as Governor Walker's. And then the unions came in with tens of millions of dollars and they had it reversed you know, in the next, in, in, a, in a, a voter referendum initiative. So the odds of winning are very small, given how powerful and big the unions have become. People don't, and I talk about this in, in, in Not Accountable, but what the unions have done have become basically a new spoil system. And they've harnessed the power, the size of modern government, which is huge. It's almost half the economy. They've harnessed the size of it through the millions of workers who work for government into a, a interest group dedicated to preventing the reform of government. You know, so, so you can't reform government because the people who work for it uh, want to keep their power and, and their feather bedding and their prerogatives. And this is not what the framers had in mind when they created our constitutional system of governance. Yeah, and indeed, I think our listeners are, you know, I hope they don't take away some sort of political valence of this. Certainly, um, uh, the Democratic uh, Party is perhaps more sympathetic to labor 
um, and the Republican less, but I just say everyone, all of our listeners want good governance so that our listeners who may skew more progressive, uh, who may be inclined um, to support public employee unions as a knee-jerk reaction, ultimately they want better schools, safer streets, right. the public transit to work. They literally, in, in perhaps in private, should join the fight for meaningful reform. If I, you know. Yeah, so... So if, if you study the way public service works in this country, and I have a number of stories in Massachusetts about how it works in Massachusetts, you would be hard pressed to find any provisions, any of the powers that the unions exercise that are one, in the interest of the public, they're all antisocial, they use up taxpayer dollars, they make taxpayer service less efficient, or comport with basic principles of fairness. Look at what they're doing. I mean, I'm all for fair treatment of public workers. We're about to do some forums on what a good deal for teachers should be and a good deal for cops, et cetera. You can't look at these contracts and justify them, in my view, on any basis. They're simply destructive of everything that we ought to stand for. First, good government, and secondly, fair treatment of public employees. So you mentioned, of course, we are in Massachusetts, a true blue um, state uh, from governor down to, I guess, dog catcher. Um, and it seems something like this kind of reform uh, is, let's say, unlikely at the state level. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw that out there. You have a more, again, we're talking about the federal constitution. The argument in your uh, book, you make a article four, uh, which is perhaps less well known by our our, our listeners that that the, the constitution mandates that all states, you know, they're again they're uh, co-sovereigns, they they can run it as they like, but that it's a federal constitution a mandate that states must uh, have a small r Republican form of government. In other words, representative right. sort of Madisonian Burkean uh, uh, form of government. Um, and in the case where we've got these sclerotic systems where public unions make it impossible to govern, uh, essentially, the, the, it, there's that argument. Essentially, you can take a federal case against these kinds of, of, of entrenched right. unions. Right, right. I think that um, uh, uh, you know, I think people have largely uh, accepted my argument about Article 2 and the federal government. I mean, what no one had done was, was, was make the argument uh, about state and local government using the federal constitution, but and, and there and there is a, a a small constitutional leap required to to do what I'm about to argue, but it's a small one. It's not a big one. Article four says, "quote The United States shall guarantee to every state a republican form of government." End quote. And what James Madison said in the constitutional debates was that this guarantee clause is what it's called, means that the states can run themselves however they want. But the one thing that they must do is maintain a direct link between the voters and the officials who are actually governing. And so what that meant was that the people who are governing can't sell or give their governing authority to any private group no group of nobles, and no, quote, favored class. And what's happened with collective bargaining is that basically public officials have sold in the form of, you know, all these campaign contributions and stuff, governing powers to the public employee unions with with the result that the main tools of management for a democracy, starting with accountability itself, is no longer available. In other words, the elected officials want to reform and improve, uh, but rather than getting things done, they have essentially have to legally um, comply with a thousand page rule book that is effect effectively a defense against any kind of reform, meaning they are almost, you know, uh, legally constrained against doing their job. Right. They've given, by as, as a matter of these contracts vary in length, they're generally a couple of hundred pages. 
but but the effect of them is to and by the way it's not just the collective bargaining agreements the the public unions have gotten statutes in the states passed over the years that that um uh, that codify rights in the unions like seniority or other things that also take away management controls and one of the points that i make in the book is that state legislatures don't have the constitutional authority to take away meaningful executive authority. Their job is to pass laws and to set budgets and stuff, but they can't take away the authority of an elected executive without running afoul of the mandate of the guarantee clause that the person elected to run government have the authority to run it. And so, you know, this is the kind of, if you will, the the new idea of the of of in this book, but a bunch of legal scholars have looked at it, and while they're not giving me a bear hug, they're acknowledging that this is actually a serious argument that that has a serious chance of winning in the Supreme Court. Well, I, I tend to agree. Again, uh, if 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 voters want fit to get things done, and I guess the underlying message of this is you would like to re empower elected officials. You want to give elected leaders more power to do their job, uh, that power they've ceded perhaps voluntarily to public unions. Uh, we've established that workers in you know, civil servants want to regain pride in their work and perhaps even a raise that's, that would be warranted with better performance. So we've got a lot of people on the plus side. Uh, on the other side is you know the leadership of, of organized public unions. So again, this sounds like a David and Goliath story, but I think when you look at it more closely, it, it doesn't seem as... as, as uh, a quixotic, as as one right. might think, first blush. What? Where is the movement? Uh, where uh, your book, as you say, you've not gotten bear hugs, but is this is this the first step of a thousand, or are we uh, is this fight being joined by other legal scholars? Well, the book is just out, so this is the new idea. So people are people are still absorbing it, but I'm I'm talking with public interest uh, law firms around the country including the firm that brought the Janus case that held that unions couldn't compel non-union members to pay agency fees in, in, uh, in, in a state, um, including the group that brought that case. So we're, we're talking with them. I'm talking with some attorneys general from different states. So sometime in the next few months, I guess, we would like to be in a position where we could uh, be really rolling up our sleeves and and preparing the cases in one or more states to to have the union controls invalidated. And you don't have to have the union itself invalidated. What you need is to restore the managerial authority of the elected executives. So uh, there are you know different ways that one could do that. Um, I think it's important to make the distinction. What you're not saying is you don't want to make take away the the power of of employees to to organize, but rather the power you want to take away the power of organized public employees to change the way government runs. In other words, they can advocate right. for themselves, but not change the law to their own favor, not to become effectively legislators themselves. Yeah, that's correct. And. And I, I do have a separate argument apropos of the duty of loyalty that public employees should not be able to organize in a union uh, to uh, influence the political system in a way that favors them against the public. That because, because we stated earlier, they have a fiduciary duty to the, uh, to the public uh, that they can have whatever personal political views they want, and nobody would take away that. But when you get hundreds of thousands or millions of workers together, and you harness billions of dollars a year in dues, then all of a sudden you've got a gorilla in democracy that no one can ignore. And these are people who supposedly owe duties to serve the public, not to make the public serve them. So, um, you know, I think that's a somewhat harder argument than the than the guarantee clause and the Article Two arguments. Uh, 
but it's one that I also want to try to get to the Supreme Court. Okay, we, we're running up on a, a, our time limit here. Uh, I'm sure our listeners have more questions that I should have asked, but uh, they, of course, can always run and go get your book. So let's let's talk about where, where they can find your book. And you're also, I guess, founder or, or head of uh, um, Common Good. So where can our listeners who whose interest you've piqued here, where can they find Not Accountable and uh, more about your, your writing and your work? Well, you can find Not Accountable, hopefully, in any bookstore and certainly at Amazon and all the other online dealers. Um, I'm the chair of this group called Common Good, that commongood.org. Uh, and we only have one idea, which is that humans have to be free to make things happen. So we've been involved, been involved in a number of reform initiatives. We work closely with think tanks from around the country. Um, we're a very small group. We have a big initiative on streamlining infrastructure permitting, for example. Some of our proposals are now in law, and we've been working with Senator Manchin's staff to get more of them in law so that we can build high-speed transmission lines. That's an example. But, but you can't get the permits for that until you empower officials to make those kinds of decisions. So ultimately, everything we do has to do with human empowerment. Teachers have to be empowered to maintain order in the classroom. Principals have to be empowered to run a school. You know, mayors have to be empowered to make judgments about what's working and what's not and transform the culture of different agency. So that's what, um, that's what we do, commongood.org. And again, we, I, th I think we've worked in the past with Pioneer Institute and, and we liked working with other groups. And get, well, I think uh, we're a, a similar mind. Uh, Pioneer certainly advocates many of those same principles. Uh, so you've uh, you've got a friend with with uh, this think tank. So I want to thank you for your your very, very generous uh, uh, gift of your time. Uh, I recommend the book, uh, and I think, as you say, this is the uh, start of a, a particular legal argument. Uh, and let's hope it it gets some some traction and and uh, uh, since some success. So uh, you're very courageous to write the book and I appreciate uh, you being with us today. Thank you for joining me on Hubwonk today, Philip. Great to be with you, Joe. This has been another episode of Hubwonk. If you enjoyed today's show, there are several ways to support Hubwonk and Pioneer Institute. It would be easier for you and better for us if you subscribe to Hubwonk on your iTunes podcatcher. If you wanna make it easier for others to find Hubwonk, it would be great if you offer a five-star rating or a favorable review. We're grateful when you share Hubwonk with friends. If you have ideas or comments or suggestions for me about future episode topics, you're welcome to email me at hubwonk at pioneerinstitute.org. Please join me next week for a new episode of Hubwonk.